understanding systems, um, the underlying systems behind the yoke. Um, tonight's webinar, we want to talk about just a little bit of the systems in the Cessna 172 um, and starting with me, right? Again, my name is Michael Conley. I'm a CFII here at Princeton Flying School. I've been here since August of 2022 and I've been enjoying it every day since. It's been a pleasure working with uh, all of you, flying with all of you guys, seeing the smiles on your faces. Uh, my first intro flight here at Princeton was in 2013. And it's funny because even to this day, like I think back every single time I came in for like a written Steve would remember me from like very small to like here. So they always remembered me. So it's like I was I was there from very young. I started flying there, did my intro flight here. Um, and then I continued thereafter. Uh, I'm an audio engineer and IT specialist on the side. I do a lot of work um, freelance for I have some pictures of things that I like to do on the side there, help stadiums uh, develop lighting designs. I do a lot of stuff in New York and um, I do a lot of engineering projects in aviation. Like there's a heads up display that I'm working on with a friend um, on a Cherokee there. We're running it through like a Raspberry Pi. So I do like little aviation projects um, on the side there and right? working using my IT knowledge to build on thereafter. All right, so tonight, now, we should strive to learn about what's happening in the aircraft. I, I had this slide here um, because you know, when you think about it, a lot of people, they drive cars every single day. They're driving from point A to point B. And it's funny because a majority of Americans, a majority of people don't know what happens when they push the power button of their car, right? The, the on the start button. And I think it's the same thing in aviation. A lot of people, when they turn that mag switch to the start, they really don't really understand what the underlying concepts there are going on inside the engine and what's happening. So I think it's important that in aviation, we hold it to a higher standard to understand what's going inside our engine. Knowledge leads to understanding, understanding leads to clarity. And that's kind of like the theme that I want to bring on to uh, tonight's webinar. I wanted to find something that the FAA could say, right? I wanted to find some FAA interpretation to help justify the means of tonight's presentation. And the thing that I could find, the closest thing I could find, this is a stretch, but I think it's worth listing 91.103. Each pilot in command before beginning the flight shall become familiar with all available information concerning that flight. And yes, they do allude to weather and all that information, but I do think that this can include aircraft, understanding your aircraft, understanding what's going on in your aircraft and being familiar with that. I think that goes a long way. All right, guys, continuing through, let's talk about what's at Princeton, shall we? At Princeton Airport, our aircraft, uh, we do have the diamond, I didn't leave it in here, but as far as Cessna 172, since that's the theme of tonight, Cessna 172s, we have the Cessna 172P model, Cessna 172R model, and the Cessna 172S model. Um, uh, the Cessna 172P, uh, 160 brake horsepower, 2700 RPM. The Cessna 172R, 160 uh, brake horsepower at 2400 RPM. And the Cessna 172S at 180 brake horsepower at 2700 RPM. So if you are ever swapping aircraft back and forth and one day go, huh, this aircraft feels more powerful. Well, you know, you're probably in the S model or a P model, which has a slightly smaller structure with a more powerful engine. So all of that goes hand in hand, but these are the three types of uh, models that you'll see on our field out there, right? Continuing through, let's talk about the Cessna 172 itself, right? It's the most manufactured aircraft in human history. Uh, I found that on Wikipedia, which was interesting, which makes sense, right? Because it's, it's so versatile. It's been used in so many different use cases around the world from military to search and rescue. Um, it's robust and it's cost effective. And that's why so many, it's, you can find a Cessna 172 on any part of the planet. And that's how, I think that's a testament to how amazing the platform is and how robust it is, which I really like flying it. Um, so yeah, that just, I mean, even here in this image, you see the Civil Air Patrol. The, it is a part of the United States Air Force. So it's actively being used in the United States uh, military as we speak. So that just, again, is a testament to how great the aircraft is. Um, but as far as what we're going to be reviewing tonight, um, we will be going through these fuel systems, right? So first, we're going to go through the fuel system and go through the electrical system. Uh, 
the vacuum system and some instrument knowledge, just general instrument knowledge, um, the ignition system. And then uh, I have grouped together uh, individual slides on miscellaneous systems, such as the oil, the hydraulic, so on and so forth. So it just gives you a little bit of synopsis of the entirety of the uh, Cessna 172. So first, digging into the fuel system. Um, so the fuel system is comprised of these components here. So this is the Cessna 172S fuel system. Um, this diagram is excellent because it goes from top to bottom. It's gravity, right? So the Cessna 172 is a gravity-fed system. You have two fuel tanks on either side. They're connected. Can you guys see my mouse by any chance? I hope you can. Um, uh, but regardless... Uh, you'll be flowing through. Great. So you can see the two fuel tanks on either side. They flow down to the fuel selector. Um, from the fuel selector, it goes to the fuel reservoir, from the fuel reservoir to the auxiliary fuel pump, which you guys probably uh, know by using that to prime the aircraft for startup. Then it goes through the fuel strainer to the engine-driven pump, and then through the fuel distributor. And we'll go through each of these elements uh, pretty much uh, in depth just to understand what they are. Continuing through, the fuel tanks themselves, right? This says the 172S in the R model, it holds 53 US gallons usable, whereas the Cessna 172P model holds 40 US gallons usable. Typically in the Cessna 172, you have a concept called unusable fuel. Uh, so meaning that the total fuel capacity of an aircraft is larger than what can be used in the aircraft. And typically, in the 172, it will be 1.5 gallons on either side of uh, the tanks. So in the 172S and the R model, you're going to have 56 gallons usable, uh, sorry, uh, total, and then 53 gallons usable, whereas in the Cessna 172P model, you'll have 43 gallons total and uh, 40 gallons usable. And what is this unusable fuel concept? I, I found this nice little uh, moving image here from Bold Method, and I think it kind of showed it in a uh, really good light, right? You can see that the fuel line uh, depicted there, that's where it's being um, gravity fed into the system. But it sits right above the bottom of the tank section, and, and that bottom where the uh where it has a little space there that is called the unusable fuel so it, there's a little layer underneath the fuel line that goes into the system why All right people why would you put the fuel line at a midsection in the fuel tank that doesn't make any sense but when you think about it why do we sump the tanks which we're going to go into next because we want the sediments and all the water to settle to the bottom of the tank. This is just a redundancy system to make sure that it doesn't go into the fuel tanks. So that is uh, how, why Cessna designed it that way. Cessna designed it as an integral fuel system, right? So it is, the fuel tank itself is a structural component of the wing. And that is, um, means that it's very well reinforced. And you can see that in that diagram as well. The fuel, uh, caps that sit atop the aircraft that we all open to check our fuel tank, they are ventilated as well, right? So there is a little hole um, in the top of the fuel cap that will allow air to fill uh, the entire fuel tank uh, as the fuel depletes. All right, continuing through to the vent and sump. So underneath the fuel tanks, we have fuel sumps underneath the fuel tanks, uh, five fuel tank, uh, five sumps on each wing of the S and the R model, and then one fuel sump on each wing of the Cessna 172P. We have three uh, uh, fuel sumps on the bottom of the Cessna 172 S and the R models as well, and we'll talk about the different locations. And then in the P model, we have a fuel strainer that you can uh, access uh, through the uh, port where you check the oil or the oil cap underneath there. The reason why we sump the fuel tank in the Cessna 172 is just like I said before, checking for water and sediment, right? Water is eight pounds per gallon. Um, yeah, eight pounds, whereas uh, fuel is six. So water is more dense than fuel, which causes it to float to the bottom of the tank. And oftentimes when you sump the tank, you'll see that depicted as a bubble or water bubbles. 
Um, in addition, right, it helps us check for proper fuel, um, which we're going to go over to, I believe, in the next slide. Uh, we're going to go into the different types and the different colors. But it helps us check for the proper fuel, um, and we'll go into the colors there. Then we have the fuel vent that sits off the wing there. We'll have a bigger picture in the next slide. But uh, the reason for the fuel uh, vent is to help uh, exhaust the fuel when it expands, right? So it sits atop the tank so that when the fuel does expand and go over the boundary, it will leak out of the fuel vent. You're going to see this a lot as the weather starts warming up and that fuel tank starts uh, expanding and, and uh, the liquid in there starts overfilling. You'll see it leak out of uh, the aircraft after uh, filling it. And uh, it's just be mindful whenever you're uh, checking the aircraft, make sure that fuel vent is not clogged because I'd rather have the fuel leak out a little bit than, you know, uh, explosive compression inside the fuel tanks, right? So you definitely want to make sure that it uh, definitely stays open because hot heat and uh, fuel do not mix very well. All right, next slide. I have it just a little bit closer, just uh, so that we don't confuse it too, right? Obviously, that's the uh, pitot tube there that gives us our airspeed, but the fuel vent sits right behind the strut um, there under the wing. All right, continuing through, let's talk about fuel. Available fuel out there for the Cessna 152. So if you look in the POH, it'll give you two approved fuel, so 100 low lead and 100. 100 low lead we'll find here at Princeton Airport. It's a uh, blue, nice Gatorade blue color. When you sump the fuel tank, you'll see it there. Um, and again, we're just checking the color as well. Very important to know the color, and we'll talk about why here. 100 is green. It's been deprecated. It doesn't exist in the United States for as far as we know. Um, I don't believe it exists anymore, but it's just good to know that the, the Cessna 172 can accept, right? Um, so those are the approved fuels in the Cessna 172. There are other types of fuels, and this is not to be confused. I'll clarify this um, later, but this is not to be confused with fuel that you can use in the Cessna. But uh, there are other types of fuel available in general for aircraft, right? We have Jet A, uh, which is a clear color. They say it's a straw color. It's very pungent, right? It smells like, I think it's kerosene, they call it, right? It smells like kerosene. Uh, you can't. Miss it, right? If it gets on your clothes, it's done, right? You can't even, don't even bother putting it in the dryer. It's going to stay there forever. Um, then we also have uh, MoGas available uh, out there. You only want to put this in your aircraft if it's approved, right? I'm not exactly sure what the process that goes into uh, an aircraft accepting MoGas, but um, just know it's out there. Just know, make sure that you don't put it into uh, a Cessna or an aircraft. Um, I believe it's the most stands for like motor. Um, so I do know it's used in in vehicles as well, um, but some aircraft uh, some aircraft can accept it. And I think it's it's helpful in like those remote regions. Like sometimes you see those Alaskan pilots land at a fuel station and just fill up and then take off on the road. Right, those kind of scenarios, I guess. Um, and then you also have 80, uh, which is also deprecated, which is red. The reason why it's so important to check the fuel color is because you want to make sure that you are filled up with the right fuel, right? I mean, you take one of our, um, for instance, Cessna 172s, you go to another airport, um, you throw the fuel boy a couple dollars and ask him to fill up the fuel tanks. Um, yes. You would think everybody knows a Cessna 172 takes av gas, but it's very easy to get complacent because there has been accidents in the past where people have been fueled with Jet A um, unexpectedly. And that happens, unfortunately. So it's always vigilant um, as a pilot to do your due diligence to check your own fuel um, because you don't want to get into a scenario where you are filled up with the wrong fuel and then find yourself, um, you know, stalling. Um, on takeoff. All right. So continuing through, uh, we'll go on to the next. Oop, did I go too far forward? Let's see. Good. All right. So fuel lines. Let's talk about the fuel lines and then we'll go into uh, the selector and the reservoir. So the fuel lines in the Cessna 172 are gravity fed. And um, I believe from what I got the clarification, they're in the A pillars. So when I say A pillars, if you 
look at how the roof is connected to a car, how the roof is connected to a Cessna, you'll see, um, uh, which I, sh I should have had a picture for it, but let's go up. I'll show you this depiction. See these, uh, that is, would be considered the A pillar, right, of uh, the Cessna. And then you have the B pillar in the back, or that's how I refer to it on a car at least. But I believe the, the fuel lines sit in the A pillar itself, and it goes through the center uh, to the fuel selector under our feet. Um, I could be mistaken about that, but um, that's uh, where I got the documentation from, from the service manual, at least. But you can see it in that depiction, in that graphic there, it goes through the pillars and then under our feet there to the fuel selector valve. Um, and the fuel selector uh, will kind of feed it from both tanks. So it's gravity fed, goes to the fuel selector. You can do left, right, both, or off. Um, and you'll have those function pretty normally. And it just takes it from either tank, right? So if you wanna take from the left or if you wanna take from the right, or if there's a little bit of an imbalance, right, you can select either or. Then after that, it goes from the fuel selector to the reservoir. And the reservoir, as the name suggests, right, it just is a, it's a, a tank of fuel that sits close to the aircraft. I mean, think about it, right? Uh, we have, you know, I have a couple of students who uh, like to sometimes accidentally put us into some spins or try to at least, right? So imagine if um, the uh, a gravity fed system um, had, you know, let's say the Cessna was put into an upset attitude angle for maybe a prolonged period of time. How can that fuel that's being gravity fed get to the aircraft efficiently if the aircraft is on its side or if we're recovering from a stall, anything like that. Um, the reason why is because of a reservoir. So a reservoir basically just keeps a store of fuel that's closer to the engine for quick access, pretty much, right? So that it doesn't necessarily have to rely on the gravity-fed situation in the um, in the fuel lines, all right? Um, yeah, it, keeps, it helps keep uh, keep fuel close to the engine for immediate use. Perfect. Hopefully that made sense. Cool. Next, we have the uh, fuel pumps, right? So the fuel pumps themselves, uh, I, I like to call it like a, a redundancy system because we have fuel, two fuel pumps in the Cessna 172S here particularly, right? We have the auxiliary fuel pump and then we have the engine driven pump. So they have um, both of them as backup. Normally we use it to prime the system. So the uh, auxiliary fuel pump, it'll get uh, inject a uh, fuel directly into the cylinders so that it's right there for the spark to be created. Um, and then in the case of an emergency, the auxiliary fuel pump is helped to use, uh, support the engine driven fuel pump. Um, and oftentimes you'll find this, like, let's say we have a vapor lock situation, which we'll go into a little bit later, or, um, there, uh, there's a failure of the engine driven fuel pump for any reason. It helps drive fuel to the carburetor or the um, the fuel control unit. And the reason why I say carburetor, I, um, we don't have auxiliary fuel pumps in our Cessna 172P, but there are Cessna 172Ps with auxiliary uh, fuel pumps that do directly inject it into the carburetor as well. But particularly for the Cessna 172S, um, it helps drive it to the fuel control unit. Um, particularly the engine-driven pump, which we're gonna go over shortly here. All right, well, following through, the fuel uh, strainer itself, so it sits, the fuel strainer, you'll notice on the diagram, going back to the diagram, sits between the auxiliary fuel pump and the engine-driven pump. Fuel dr uh, strainer, I kinda like to think about as a, uh, a filter, right? So it's the last point to the engine. It catches a lot of the water and the particles of sediment that are found in the aircraft's control, uh, aircraft's fuel system. Um, and this is one of the three ports that you check underneath the Cessna 172. Um, the, the strainer valves underneath there, right? The first one on the center and the farthest end of the Cessna 172, that is right beneath the fuel selector. Then you have one that sits right where the fuel shutoff valve is. 
then you have one for the fuel strainer, right? So you're checking all three of those holes underneath the Sesto 172 um, just to make sure that along each one of those points to the engine that there's no uh, sediment or any particles that can prohibit the fuel flow. Next, we have the fuel control unit itself. Um, this uh, is pretty neat. It's on the 172S and effectively it determines how much air is coming into the system or in, into the engine. And then it provides uh, the adequate percentage of fuel uh, for the fuel and air mixture. So the way that I like to describe it for my students, at least, is, I mean, you think about just cave, like from a caveman level, right? Let's create a fire. Let's create combustion. How do we do that? First, we need oxygen. Then we need a fuel source. And then we need a spark, right? Just like basic science class. Those are the elements that create combustion or fire. Um, and that's effectively what the fuel control unit is doing. It's monitoring the fuel um, flow, right? Giving the aircraft fuel as the percentage of air comes into the, um, uh, the air filter in the front of the aircraft, right? And I, I have a little bit diagram here. This is not a Cessna 172, but this is the closest kind of diagram I could find that um, uh, depicts the insides fairly accurately. Uh, that control column there, I wouldn't, uh, I would, I could, you could ignore that. And uh, we don't have a, a manifold pressure gauge that looks like that on the Cessna 172. But the diagram is pretty similar, right? So the fuel control unit sits next to the throttle body. And when you move that throttle, it opens and closes there, right? So when you open the throttle, it is actually opening the valve to increase the air into the aircraft. And what sits right next to it is the fuel control unit. So it determines how much um, you have the throttle open and then it sends the adequate percentage of fuel to the fuel injectors, which we'll talk about a little later. It just like shoots out. It's a pretty cool system. All right, awesome. Then next I have kind of like a, a model of the Cessna 172P model, because you know in there it doesn't have, it's not fuel injected. So we have a carburetor in there, and it um, flows off of a similar dis, um, kind of concept. Here in the Cessna 172P, we have a Venturi system, this kind of tube that um, kind of discharges the fuel as the throttle uh, opens and closes, right? Um, and that sends it straight into the engine. So a little bit of a different design, um, but kind of this a similar concept in terms of um, air, fuel, combustion, you know, um, sending it through there. All right. So the fuel distribution valve, I don't know why, this is my favorite part. Um, I really like um, the kind of the, the the science behind this. I think this is cool. Uh, a lot of the guys in the maintenance shop from uh, the interviews that I've had with them, they call it the spider. Because, yeah, if you look at it, it sits on top of the aircraft engine. And it looks like a spider. It has little veins that run from it. And all these little veins, they're, they're fuel lines, right? They're fuel lines flowing to each of the cylinders of the aircraft. And effectively what happens, yeah, the, the, the fuel coming from the, the control unit goes straight to um, the fuel distribution valve. And it sends fuel to each of the cylinders um, in its appropriate firing order. I mean, the last time I spoke to someone, I, I, from what I understand, it's very random, but it's sending, um, it's, it's firing fuel at each of these cylinders at thousands of times per second. Like, like, it's very cool. I don't know if you guys have ever seen videos of fuel injector, even on like a car, like it does it the same, like it sends it out in repeated, um, kind of, uh, jabs and little, uh, um, sprays almost. Right, so I think, um, and and the way that the Cessna 172 does it, I believe it's analog. Um, some newer designs will have it digital, where it, it actually understands exactly how much fuel to send in what firing order. Whereas the the Cessna 172, it does it in an analog method, which is, I think, even more impressive. 
hope that makes sense. Um, but on the fuel distribution valve, it is connected to the uh, fuel flow indicator, right? So inside the aircraft, what you're seeing with that fuel flow when you prime the aircraft, uh, when it rises, it's connected directly to that fuel distribution valve, which um, kind of understands how much pressure of fuel is going through it to each cylinder. So you're getting that information right from the source when you're looking at that uh, um, a meter inside the aircraft. Sweet. Nice. So that is the fuel system, right? So um, the next slide, I have just two diagrams. This is uh, kind of like the diagrams that you find in the POH. And, and now you kind of have a deeper understanding. Um, it looks kind of antiquated from these diagrams, but nonetheless, it's the same, right? You have the fuel quantity indicator that's connected to the fuel tanks. And from the fuel tanks, it goes into the fuel selector. Underneath the fuel selector, there's the fuel selector drain valve, like I told you, it's right in the center of the bottom of the aircraft. And then that goes to the fuel reservoir. We didn't talk too much about the check valve, but um, I was trying to find a better understanding from the fuel service, uh, from the Cessna service manual. But I believe that keeps uh, an equal flow of excess fuel from the auxiliary fuel pump right back into the fuel reservoir. So it's like a circling system. And then from the fuel reservoir, um, it goes into the um, auxiliary fuel pump to the fuel shutoff valve. So I think that's super interesting to highlight. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever tried it, but when you're on the ground, um, sometimes I like to show my students actually fully extending that fuel shutoff valve, you'll actually see how long it extends. Um, and that's, it, it, it extends so far because it's, it goes all the way down uh, this column here to the auxiliary fuel pump. So, you know, if you're ever with your instructor, see if they'll let you extend it just to see how far it actually extends in case of an emergency. Um, from there, you have the, uh, the fuel strainer that goes to the auxiliary fuel pump. Um, the fuel air control unit, and then it goes to the fuel distribution unit that sends it out and fires it all to the cylinders. Um, and then the Cessna 172P, it's a little bit of an older model, but it kind of follows the same kind of concept. If you look at it, it's not too dissimilar. Um, you have the two fuel tanks that goes to the fuel selector valve. Um, do you have a drain valve off of that? It goes to the fuel strainer, goes, um, uh, if your uh, Cessna 172P is, is equipped with an auxiliary fuel pump, which I don't believe ours, uh, ours at uh, Princeton are, it would go through the auxiliary fuel pump or it would go straight to the engine driven pump, to the carburetor, to the engine, right? So very similar design, but uh, as you can see, the, the main difference here with the Cessna 172S, you have the, um, the, the fuel pump there. All right, cool. So now let's talk about some failures that you could see, right? I have just a, a couple of failure scenarios that you may uh, find uh, with uh, the aircraft uh, if you're ever flying. Um, vapor lock, right? This is something that's super rare, but uh, only things that I've seen in videos online. Definitely check out a video on it if you have time because it's good to identify it where when fuel heats, it will create vapors inside the uh, injectors or those, remember those lines that were coming out of the um, fuel distribution valve, right? It can fill up with vapors and it, it, it will cause the engine to kind of uh, deteriorate in performance. Um, I think in the video, the only video that I saw of vapor lock online the RPMs were like, vroom, vroom. like it was going up and down and up and down. And it was very odd for the people in the cockpit just to see it going up and down because vapor, it was only injecting fuel in spaces because there was vapor stuck in between those fuel lines. So just watch out for that. Um, but super rare. So nothing that you really have to be concerned with. But if that does ever happen, fuel pump right that's what the, the the point of the auxiliary fuel pump is it helps force fuel consistently through the fuel lines um and that may help in the case of that scenario but of course you know land as soon as practical to just get it inspected next we have water in the fuel right it can also cause inconsistent engine performance especially in the fuel lines if you have that there um, but if you do see it on the ground if you're um, checking the aircraft just continue to sump the fuel tanks right 
get the, the water out of the tanks again. Water is eight pounds per gallon and fuel is six pounds per gallon. So it is less dense, it'll sink to the bottom of the tank. So typically when you sump, it will be able to take it out there. Over priming, all right? Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, a consideration as well, right? If you over prime the aircraft um, on startup, you could lead to a fire, right? Too much prime in the aircraft could um, combust and, you know, a fire, you could see a fire coming out of the front uh, uh, hood of the aircraft. I've only seen this in real life once. It wasn't, obviously it wasn't at Princeton, but um, it was at another airport where someone was trying to start a Cessna 152 and they overprimed it. And, you know, it just, the out of the front of the aircraft, it, it burst into flames. So we want to be careful of that um, and to be mindful of that, especially as these warmer months come from, if you're not able to start the aircraft and if you keep priming, keep priming and it's still not starting, Let's go inside, get help. Let's see if uh, um, someone inside can assist with the startup. And in the case that you're by yourself or you're alone, go inside, get a coffee at the FBO, wherever you're at. Open the throttle for about five to 10 minutes to allow that fuel to evaporate. Because again, you saw from the diagram, when you open the throttle, you're just opening up a valve to allow air to pass through. That air is gonna pass through, it's gonna dry up that fuel, and then you can uh, continue to, to start the aircraft. Um, that is not in relation to the starter uh, or burning out the starter, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But those are some things that uh, you want to be mindful of there. All right, cool. And that is the fuel system, guys, right? So um, hopefully that you learned uh, and engaged a little bit more information about what's going on there. Continuing through, now we're going to talk about the electrical system. Uh, the electrical system. Um, it's it's actually pretty simple in the Cessna 172. Um, you know, I was never really a fan of understanding um, uh, electrical currents and things like that. Um, but uh, the Cessna 172 is actually a fairly uh, simple uh, electrical system there, which we'll go through. So this are the these are the elements. Um, you can see. Uh, we have the alternator here, right? The, the alternator is providing power into the aircraft. It goes uh, th through the voltage regulator. Uh, and then that voltage regulator will go through what we call the bus, the aircraft bus or the main bus. And that bus sends all of that electrical power to the uh, components, right? Your radio, your transponder, your nav lights, your avionics, all of that, right? Uh, these little tabs that you see, these little up tabs, these are depictions of circuit breakers, as the legend would suggest, right? These, um, sorry, these are switches. The little uh, U under upside down U-shaped items here, these are the circuit breakers, right? So they're connected right to the aircraft bus. And then in addition, you have the battery there, which is receiving a uh, charge and powering um, some of the equipment as well in the aircraft. So yeah, we're gonna go over the alternator the, uh, slash generator, the battery, the voltage regulator, the bus bar, the circuit breakers, and the fuses, understanding the electrical system. All right, so understanding the alternator. So the alternator uses engine power to charge the battery and electrical components. Um, I like to relate it to kind of like a windmill. I don't know if you guys ever seen windmills, um, how they harvest energy from the uh, air. It's very similar to kind of like a Cessna, right? Think of the propeller like the windmill. And um, the alternator is effectively sitting right underneath uh, the, uh, the front of the propeller just to siphon the spinning motion of the propeller and just feed it right back into the uh, aircraft. Um, it runs off of like an electromagnetic motor. Most uh, alternators or uh, motors will uh, run off of kind of like an electric magnetic uh, operation. The way that it works, I'm, I'm sure you guys know what a simple magnet is, right? You have the north and south pole of a magnet. I believe uh, that once these magnetic lines of force, you know, come into contact with like a contactor, um, it will, uh, a voltage will be induced, right? I know that's kind of like a high level understanding, but layman terms, 
as the alternator spins with the electricity, uh, with the rotation of the propeller, it is generating electricity that's going into the aircraft. Uh, typically, 60 amp alternator. And um, if you had the alternator going directly into the avionics, uh, it would blow out the avionics, right? The alternator itself carries so much power and because the aircraft is, the, the propeller is spinning so fast. So think about that raw rotation power. Imagine if that raw rotation power fed directly into the avionics. It would blow up everything, right, immediately. So what can we do to, to regulate that voltage, which leads us to the voltage regulator, right? So it takes that power from the alternator and it regulates it. Um, it kind of condenses it into enough energy that is safe to distribute around the aircraft. So the voltage regulator, um, it uh, controls system voltage by controlling the electrical circuit that energizes um, by the alternator rotor, right? In the Cessna 172 28 volt regulator, it protects the equipment from being overpowered by the alternator, like we just demonstrated uh, a second ago, regulates the current from the alternator. Um, and the whole idea is that the output should be greater than uh, the battery, which we'll go into 28 volt regulator, 24 volt uh, battery. Um, and that will uh, send electricity as a battery, which will cause it to charge. Typically, you'll find this connected to the firewall um, and just like mentioned before, right, sends power to the battery. All right, so then the battery that's connected over there, let's talk about that, right? Again, like I said, 24 volt battery and um, forgive me, but that's, that's you know my limited understanding. That's how uh, electricity works in a way, right? So you need um, your source of electricity when you're dealing with batteries needs to be a higher voltage than the battery itself that will cause it to charge. Um, if we had a 24 volt um, a voltage regulator and a 24 volt battery, um, charge, charge wouldn't happen, right? I believe, you know, nothing, none of the sources would be able to take any electricity. And even worse, if the voltage of the a regulator was less than a battery. And I think this is very similar, don't quote me, but I think this is very similar to um, why jump starting a car works. Because the battery with more voltage is able to send it to the battery with less. Um, uh, don't quote me on that, but I, I believe that's kind of like the same concept of how electricity will flow through a system. And that's kind of like the same concept here with the voltage regulator. The voltage regulator sits at 28. So it's able to trickle it through the battery and then charge the battery, uh, which is a 24 volt. Main thing you want to know about batteries is that uh, cold weather will reduce performance. Um, so that's why in the wintertime, um, even I told my students, just let's um, be very, very quick if we're going to, and let's only retract the flaps only this much uh, when starting the aircraft, because, you know, I'm sure uh, maybe some of you guys have found, yeah, like even when you're starting aircraft in the wintertime, the cold battery, it, it does affect it. Uh, it does definitely reduce it. Um, the battery also conserves uh, electricity when the alternator is not providing electricity. So let's say you have an alternator failure, which we'll go into. Um, the battery will hold or power your avionics for typically a good battery will do it, will hold it for about 45 minutes, um, but typically about 30 minutes. Um, and let's say you're flying in, in perfectly VFR weather. Yeah, if you if you realize that you see the volts light off your uh, enunciator display or you see the ammeter showing a negative charge, get down to the ground in, in about 30 minutes or, or sooner, as soon as practical. But just know that um, for your as far as your avionics go, as far as your radios go, you have about 30 minutes. Um, and that's not connected, that's not uh, a rel in relation to the actual engine. So make sure that's not confused, right? Um, that's a common misconception. Um, if your battery goes or if your alternator goes, 
your engine will still perform. However, your avionics will, um, uh, you know, cease to operate. Um, and then, just like I mentioned, the ammeter there, it shows electrical charge um, uh, to the battery. So if you have a positive reading, it means that more electricity is going into the battery than is being withdrawn. And if it's a negative, it means that there's a discharge of the battery. Um, be mindful. Um, uh, you know, all gauges, you know, they, they're not perfect. So even though you may see uh, it be uh, at near or close to zero, that's fine. Um, typically, the gauges may get displaced due to the vibration. So um, don't, if you see it at zero, don't be alarmed. What you can do to test is to turn off the alternator, right? You can see the master switch there, turn off the alternator, and you'll actually see it drop to the zero level, uh, to the true zero level, and you'll know that it is charging. So just be mindful of that. All right, so the voltage regulator, we saw in the diagram um, earlier that the voltage regulator, I'm going up now, the voltage regulator is connected to the aircraft bus. So what is a aircraft uh, bus or a master bus, I should say? A bus, I like to relate it to like a power ship. That's why I put it here. It basically takes a bunch of items and puts it into one bar. Like a power strip is very similar to what a bus would be in an aircraft. And um, this is not, uh, this is a, uh, uh, an example of a different type of Cessna, but it, it shows in the aircraft, you see all the circuit breakers and you could see placarded there, it's separated into different bus lines. It's very similar to a power ship being plugged into a bunch of different ports and the circuit breakers along each, each um, uh, row or, or lane. Um, in this way, uh, you can, you don't have to, uh, it's, it's almost like a redundancy system. So if there's an overcharge on a bus system, it won't shut down the entire, um, array of avionics. It will segment it into different, uh, arrays, right? So continuing bus bar is used as a terminal in the aircraft electrical system to connect the main electrical system to equipment using electricity as a source of power, right? On the front of the bus bar, you'll have circuit breakers. And again, it's just a common point which voltage can be distributed. Um, along the bus bar you have those circuit breakers um and it's to protect it's protect from electrical overload right so let's say um you do have an instance where something is not connected correctly and then the circuit breaker does pop it's protecting the aircraft system from overloading itself um uh, so that's the benefit of it Oftentimes you'll hear about fuses. I know uh, when you're talking about required equipment for night flying, you'll you'll hear the word fuses being used. This is not a uh, use. Uh, fuses and circuit breakers are um, kind of uh, two two of the same types of technology. Um, fuses are not really common in aircraft. Uh, they've been deprecated because the, the problem is a circuit breaker is resettable. So when it pops, you can push it back in, right? For me, when a circuit breaker pops in the aircraft, uh, or if it, if it were, I would just push it back in um, and the avionics work again, right? Uh, if it pops again, get it inspected, right? So that's, you know, only, only pop it in up to one time. But if it pops again, then you know that maybe something needs to be checked. But whereas a fuse, when a fuse pops, it pops, right? The fuse doesn't work anymore. It's done. So um, that's why fuses are not used in modern day uh, aircraft because once it pops, it's 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 smoked. You have to replace the fuel fuse. You have to go and, and buy another fuse that's rated for the power. So yeah, um, that's the one thing with uh, circuit breakers that are the benefit. Um, uh, yeah, um, and then on the front of the, the last point that I have here, the numbers on the circuit breakers, typically you'll see that on some, uh, it just shows the amperage limit of each circuit breaker there. Sweet. All right. So next, let's go look at the overview here. This is a, a basic overview of the electrical system, right? It comes, goes from the alternator to the regulator. It goes to the bus. Um, and uh, that is, 
that is enabled through the uh, master switch, which is, um, and you know, connected through a master solenoid. Um, and then from there, the battery, right? So that's just a general overview. It's a 24 volt DC electrical system powered uh, by a 60 amp alternator, belt driven and a 24 volt battery. Failure scenarios, right? So what happens, let's talk about some failures. Ooh, alternator failure. Um, yeah, yeah, this is, this is something that can happen. Um, that belt, when we, when we pre-flight, we're checking the tension on the belt. Um, the reason why we want to make sure it, it's not loose or frayed or, or it's, it's coming loose because, you know, that is, that can happen, right? Um, where the belt will snap and, and, uh, you'll lose your alternator. But like, like I just said before, if you're in daytime VFR situation, you have about 30 minutes of use time. What I would do, it's funny because this happened on my uh, instrument check ride in IMC, right? In, in an IMC scenario, it's an emergency, right? You want to land as soon as possible within those 30 minutes. But in the daytime VFR scenario, it's still, you know, I'd still consider it, you know, something you want to be pedantic about. You still want to land as soon as practical, right? Versus as soon as possible, as soon as practical. Um, and you want to start by conserving electrical power in the aircraft. So if you have a COM1 and COM2, shut off COM2. Um, if you have a, a GPS that you're not using, shut that GPS off. If you have an ADF receiver that you probably aren't using, shut it off, right? So conserve electricity as much as possible if you have an alternator failure. Land as soon as possible. Again, the common misconception, um, if the alternator fails, nothing will happen to your engine at all. So yes, um, theoretically, you could stay in the air for as long as you have fuel with an alternator failure. The avionics will shut off, you'll lose your radios, you'll lose your transponder, so you'll probably run into some other issues. Um, <clears throat> but theoretically, um, it's not a dire situation in terms of the engine. Um, and then, you know, let's say you have an overheat in circuit, like I just spoke about before. Let's say a circuit breaker pops due to over voltage. Um, and this could be a variety of reasons. Uh, I know my DPE for my CFI exam, he gave me a cool scenario. It was like, you know, if, if let's say your nav light, um, circuit breaker pops and you push it, that circuit breaker back in and let's say it pops again. I'm not enabling that again. Why? Because what, who's to say there's a contactor at the end of the nav light itself that's broken and maybe it's sparking, maybe it's sparking and maybe that overcharge from the spark is what's causing the circuit breaker to pop. So that's why I tell people if a circuit breaker pops, pop it in again. No, nah, it's a non-issue, right? If it pops again, right? Maybe that's something to take another look at, right? Um, land as soon as practical if it's a non-essential system, right? And just have someone take a look. That's all, right? So just uh, uh, issues and failures that we can run into. Cool. All right. Um, continuing through. I know time is a little of essence here, but bear with me here. Vacuum and pedal uh, static system and, and its interest, uh, instruments, right? So I know um, the great Wesley had gone over a uh, presentation on this before. So we'll skim through this um, just to remind you guys about different things about the avionics themselves um, and what goes on behind there. Um, but if you guys want a little bit more in-depth resources than that, Wesley does have a great presentation on the website that goes deep dive into the instruments as well. Cool, cool, cool. All right, next slide there. All right, so first, let's talk about the vacuum system, right? Um, uh, the vacuum system, uh, let me get the description up here for me. Vacuum system uh, sends pressure through a vacuum pump. Uh, that creates suction to spin the gyros, right? All, all of our gyro instruments in the aircraft. It's a differential pressure indication or a, a differential pressure system. Um, and that pressure is being measured uh, through a sealed diaphragm or a capsule. So um, just a simple pump, right? So it's an enclosed system and it, it has a motorized pump that's sucking air 
out and creating a vacuum in there that will ultimately help spin those gyros faster and faster and faster. The gauge, the vacuum gauge is calibrated in inches of mercury. So that's what you see when you look at the suction gauge and you say it's in the green. It's, it's, it's measured in inches of mercury and it's used for the heading indicator and the attitude indicator um, as well, right? Just making sure. Air is pulled through the system, causing the gyro to spin, and um, the uh, it determines the rate at which the gyro spins. So, um, the 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 more when your vacuum system is in the green, um, it's able to keep your attitude indicator, your heading indicator, very rigid in space. Um, and oftentimes, you'll notice it's assisted with the engine. So. When you're taxiing down to the runway, part of the reason why I'm so adamant with my students to uh, return when you're after you're slowing down the aircraft, return the throttle or the aircraft to a, th a thousand RPMs reading is because the engine is helping to keep the the alternator running and also providing uh, enough vacuum pressure throughout the system as well. And you'll notice on your run-up, you'll see the vacuum gauge kind of spike up there and then increase um, because it is helped with the uh, it's engine dripping as well. Okay, so we'll run through these next slides here because again, you guys should know this information. And if you can, if you want to know more inf information about the six pack, um, attitude indicator, heading indicator, turn coordinator, airspeed indicator, and the altimeter and vertical speed indicator. Um, the pedostatic system itself. Uh, this is a com uh, this is a, a depiction of the pedal tube, right? So again, ram air goes to the pedal tube and it detects its pressure <clears throat> in the chamber. That pressure chamber, sorry, get some water. My voice is drying out, but yeah, that that pressure chamber builds up and that moves the airspeed indicator right um and then in that same combined system the static port is also connected providing information to our altimeter our vertical speed indicator and our airspeed indicator and you can see in this depiction the uh um pedal tube is directly connected into the airspeed indicator whereas the static port supplies uh information to all three of the instruments right um, when you get up into altitude, the air that's hitting the pitot tube is less dense, which the static port is taking into account. And then it's able to adjust for those minute differences in air pressure as well. Then uh, the vertical speed indicator, you guys know that's a differential uh, pressure instrument. And then the altimeter as well. It's uh, running off the static port as you climb and climb the air uh, less dense and then it moves the altimeter as well. Cool. All right. Continuing through altimeter, it's in case there's a little wafer inside the altimeter. Um, it, it's called an aneroid wafer and that expands and retracts as you go up and down in uh, altitude. And that is connected to a gear linkage that's linked to the front fascia of the altimeter, uh, which is the needle itself that moves with that wafer. Continuing through, vertical speed indicator, uh, kind of same deal, right? So this one is a differential pressure instrument. And you can see the difference between this one and the altimeter is that there's a calibrated leak in the back of the vertical speed indicator um, that will dissipate the pressure that's built up inside. That's why the vertical speed indicator returns to zero instead of keeping that pressure built up. Because if it did build up that pressure, it would be showing pretty similar to an altimeter, right? That aneroid wafer in there, you see that diaphragm, rather that diaphragm would just continually expand and expand and expand if that um, leak did not pass through the system. Airspeed indicator. Um, this one, you can see it's a diaphragm, except the diaphragm is uh, on its side. Um, so 
that's what happens when that pressure builds, the diaphragm expands and it rotates the gears and linkages, which leads to the, um, the needle moving in there as well. Something that I don't have on the slides, which I'll touch on again, um, we'll, we'll come back to that actually when the failures happen, actually. All right. Attitude indicator. Um, this is a gyro system. So that vacuum tube, it's spinning the gyro that's inside the uh, attitude indicator. Um, it's operating off of uh, uh, the principle of rigidity in space. So it's keeping the, um, the plate, uh, the horizontal plane, or the, the horizon disk, uh, solid uh, in the aircraft as well. All right. Continuing through, same principle with the heading indicator. It's a gimbal, but it's on its side this time, right? So it's rotating there <clears throat> to keep that rigidity in space. Now, common is uh, issues when you're dealing with systems and um, uh, the instrument panel. You could have a vacuum failure, right? A vacuum leak or a total failure will uh, reduce uh, suction to the gyroscopic instruments. And you'll notice maybe your alt attitude indicator may start swooping and maybe your heading indicator is not really holding heading. Um, uh, that's, let's say you're, you're in a um, instrument environment uh, or an IFR route, you're gonna wanna land as soon as possible. All right, so I want to clarify, as soon as possible is different than land as soon as practical, right? So, whereas if you're dealing in a VFR environment where you can see the horizon, where you know your attitude, um, where you do have a magnetic compass, if you did have a vacuum failure, it's more so land as soon as practical, right? So, you know, it's not an emergency per se, just, you know, you want to get it land and get it checked. A beetle tube clog will... Um, can cause unreliable airspeed indicators. Um, what I would do in this situation, let's say your pewter tube is clogged and you didn't check it properly, or maybe a bee got stuck in there while you were taxiing, um, turn on the pewter heat uh, in the winter, right? In the winter time, um, it's more plausible that maybe uh, it did get clogged with some ice or maybe there's ice in the system, just heat up the pewter tube. And if that still doesn't work, Try the alternate static because, again, the alternate static is also connected to the airspeed indicator, which may be the problem. Maybe your, your static port is clogged, so just check that as well. If that still doesn't work, I would uh, rely on your RPM settings for landing. And you guys know this, right? Uh, when you're a beam, 1,500 RPMs, um, you know, typically if you, if you keep that all the way through and you keep a short approach, um, <clears throat> you should be able to determine the RPM settings that will keep your consistent uh, uh, speeds, all right? Very similar to when you're cruising. We cruise at a typical RPM setting of 2,300 RPMs, and that keeps us around 100 knots. So, you know, for every RPM setting, you're typically going to expect a certain speed associated if you're at straight and level flight. So definitely try that as well. Static port clog um, will cause pressure to stay in the system, attitude and vertical speed indications will stay constant and the airspeed will show unreliable readings. Check your alternate static and check that, see if that works there. Um, and then if you are in an emergency situation like an uh, uh, IFR environment, <clears throat> you can crack the glass um, and the gl uh, cracking glass will enable that diaphragm to uh, take the outside pressure um, and it won't give you accurate readings, but it will it will be uh, um, fairly reliable. Uh, uh, it'll be it'll be reliable enough to land on um, is the word. Cool. All right, almost through, guys. All right. So continuing there, that is the uh, instruments there. Then we go through the ignition system. Running through the ignition system. Uh, it's what happens when you start the aircraft, right? You take that key, you start it up. Let's dive in here briefly. Here's what happens when you turn the key, right? Um, you turn the magnetos, right? You enable the magnetos on either side when you go from right to the left. 
Then when you go into the start position, the battery sends power to the starter unit and it spins. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen that kind of gear that sits behind the propeller. It spins that flywheel, which uh, starts moving the crankshaft. And when the crankshaft starts moving, the magnetos are able to sustain themselves and send um, spark to the spark plugs, which starts that combustion. You see, that's the full circle right there. Remember how we just spoke about the elements of, of, of fire, right? You have fuel, you have a, uh, a spark, and then you have oxygen, and then combustion, right? So the magnetos send to the spark plugs that spark that's needed for the final piece of the combustion. That's how engines operate, just a bunch of mini explosions that move the pistons back and forth. All right, so I'll go into that here briefly. Magnetos, uh, real quickly, um, <clears throat> self-contained engine-driven units supply electrical current to the spark plugs like I spoke about before. We have a very nice redundancy system in the Cessna 172, right? We have a left mag, we have a right mag, and you can see these little split connections. You have two spark plugs per cylinder. So that's really cool, right? It's a, it's a good redundancy system um, that happens. And when you do go up to the run-up area and you're checking to the left or to the right mag, you're checking each of these redundant systems, making sure that they're firing correctly um, and making sure um, that it is operating sufficiently. Continuing through, uh, here's a closer little diagram of what that looks like that you guys can take a look once we provide you guys with these slides. Um, those magnetos connected to the spark plugs, again, they're providing the spark, right? We have the air coming through the intake. We have the fuel coming through the fuel system. We have those two things together. All we need is spark, and then we create a combustion in the cylinders. Each cylinder has two spark plugs, combust that fuel air mixture, um, and then uh, it fires back and forth. Uh, it's horizontally opposed, so those two cylinders are, are firing back and forth against each other as that combustion happens. Continuing through. The starter engages the aircraft flywheel, All right? Um, again, powered by the onboard battery. Um, once you turn that, it starts the starter solenoid, which energizes the, <clears throat> the starter which will uh, spin the propeller, which therefore moves the crankshaft, which therefore will ignite the magnetos to self-sustain the aircraft, and then it will uh, start. Before you start, of course, make sure it's visually clear and you call um, clear prop. All right. Um, and there's a little bit of a diagram of how it's connected, right? Again, that main bus that we were talking about, the bus, same bus, it also is connected to the starter. And when you turn the ignition switch, it sends power through the main bus, through the starter contactor, which is almost like a safety switch, sending power to that starter, um, enabling the aircraft to start there. So most of what I was talking about, right? Combustion, right? Creating that fire, right? I, I really like this moving image here. It kind of shows how it moves. Uh, that cylinder moves in like a, a roundabout motion. And that uh, combustion happens at the top of the cylinder head, uh, pushing back that crankshaft, which therefore opposes the other um, cylinder, moving it back and forth against each other. All right. Um, the uh, fuel air mixture begins to burn, right? And then it... Uh, um, it get, burns to a point where it's ignited by the spark plugs. It burns away from the plugs till it's all consumed. Um, it uh, is a nice, uh, smooth buildup of temperature and pressure. So that's why you're going to notice the aircraft needs time to uh, kind of build to a nice operating condition. In the wintertime, as you guys know, probably from your instructors, you want to, after starting the aircraft, you want to keep those RPMs between 800 and 1,000 RPMs for proper engine care. Why? Because I'm sure you guys have learned in basic science class, heat expands objects. And um, same thing in an engine. Uh, an engine is like a, it's, it's a, a, a metallic block, but heat still can affect metals. Um, so 
if you start the aircraft and you're like, you know, keep it at, you know, maybe 1500 RPMs, which, you know, is, is a lot. Or if you do something absurd like that, you're, you're heating up the engine from cold to hot really quickly, which is in turn causing those metals to expand. And when things expands, there can be cracks. So let's help take care of the aircraft and the engines by not overheating and causing uh, a mass expansion in the metals. We don't want cracks. So just care for these aircraft like they're your own. Um, so a little bit of a, 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 a top view. Again, this is the uh, fuel distribution unit that we were talking about before the spider, right? It's sending those little fuel lines to each of the cylinders, right? And then you have the spark plugs on the tops and the bottom of each of the cylinders. So it's all working in tandem, all together. And they're firing back and forth. And that is moving the propeller. So that's a pretty cool, unique aspect of it. And that's really what happens when you turn that key. All right, let's talk about some common failures. Vapor lock, again, right? Just going back to vapor lock, we already discussed it before, but these are the fuel lines that I was talking about. Vapor can enter into those fuel lines and um, you can see how that could be a problem because that can mess up the, the firing order and the timing. If let's say there's air going into the cylinder, but not enough fuel, right? So that is a danger there. Um, overuse of the starter. Um, you'll see it placarded in, in some of the S models. Uh, if you if you try and start that aircraft um, for more than I believe it, it says more than and then three times, it'll actually say on the placard to wait twenty minutes for it to cool down because it will. Uh, it's very easy to burn out the starter motor. Um, go inside, go into the FBO, get some help, ask somebody who's more experienced or who understands, or you know who can offer some advice. To assist you with the startup because the last thing you want to do is to burn up the starter especially if you're away from home or at a at, at another airport over priming which we spoke about introducing too much fuel prime into the aircraft could ignite the um the the this the aircraft again i've seen this in real life only once it's not it's not like a like a explosion like a top gun explosion it's like um you know it, it'll it'll combust right it'll be a little bit scary but Take your time, uh, take the um, the fire extinguisher, jump out of the aircraft. Well, before you jump out of the aircraft, cut the fuel valve, uh, cut the mixture, uh, make sure everything's off, shut off the master, turn off the key, uh, go take the uh, fire extinguisher, go to the front of the aircraft and douse it, right? Quick, easy, make sure, just uh, take a breather, step back. But if you get to the point where you feel that you've overprimed the aircraft, open the throttle for about five to 10 minutes, allow the fuel to evaporate. Um, and another scenario here, <clears throat> which um, some people may run into, a rough running mag check. So you um, are at the run up area and then you check the left, and you check the, the right mag or you check the right mag you check the left mag and one of the mags when you get on there it, it sounds running rough I, I just actually had this with my last student um and and all you do uh, sometimes on the spark plugs themselves uh you get some like uh carbon deposits build up on the spark plugs which prevent it from firing um well what you want to do you want to put it the mag needles back to both Make sure you leave it at the designated um, run-up RPM setting, whether it's 1700 or 1800, and then lean the mixture as you would when you're going on a cross country. So bring out that mixture gradually until you see the rise. Let it sit there for a couple of uh, seconds. That will allow those deposits to burn off. And then make sure the mixture goes all the way back in, um, uh, and then recheck the mags on either side, and then it should be smooth running thereafter. So nothing to worry about uh, there. All right, all right, um, last uh, topic here, miscellaneous systems. Um, just one sliders for each of the little systems. Um, I kind of planned on just explaining these on the fly since I didn't think I'd have enough time for all of them, but cabin and cooling system, 
Um, on the exhaust pipe of the Cessna 172, there's a shroud, like there's a, um, a system to kind of uh, take all that heat in as the exhaust comes out of the cylinders, right? So after that, that combustion happens, the one that I've been talking about all this time, um, it, there's going to be a smoke or exhaust that comes off of that combustion. And that is what you get out of the exhaust pipe. That gets very hot very quickly. Um, and what the Cessna engineers designed is that they take that heat from around the exhaust pipe and they send it straight into the cabin. I think it's a pretty genius system. I think it's pretty cool. Um, uh, but I think, it, I think it's very efficient, uh, at least, right? It sends it straight into the cabin. That's why when you turn on the cabin contr heating control, it's just an on and off because you're just opening that door to the heater system and you're closing it. Um, let's say you start smelling exhaust fumes in, in the aircraft or you see maybe smoke come out of the vents of the system. Not a big issue, right? The, the, the main thing there is that there's probably a leak uh, in the... Uh, cabin heating or in the exhaust shroud to the cabin. So just close the, um, turn off the heater, maybe open a window if it's really bad and just land as soon as practical, right? So just make sure that you uh, just be mindful of that. Um, and then as far as uh, air conditioning goes, you can open the cabin air, which is right underneath the heater, right? Which opens the door um, on the side of the aircraft. So if you see that little gap open on the side of the aircraft just know that the cabin air vent is open on the side which allows air to pass through cool air hydraulic system uh we have a hydraulic system in the aircraft which accurate act actuates the brakes um uh very simple system you have a reservoir right just holds the hydraulic fluid it goes through to a pump and that pump goes to cylinders which actuate right um just hydro uh, it's 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 just simple fluid that um compresses enough to where it can create pressure to actuate certain items like your brakes um that's why whenever you check uh your tires you want to look around for any red hydraulic fluid because that's the color it will be. It'll be leaking maybe through some of the pipes, right? So we're just looking for any leak of that type. If you see any leaks like that, just definitely report it. Um, continuing through, our oil system, very, very important. The oil, like I like to say, has four roles to clean, cool, seal, and lubricate the engine, right? In the Cessna 172s that we have, we have a wet um a uh, system meaning that the oil is stored underneath the engine, not in a separate location. And it's a, a very simple system, right? Right here, we have the oil sump. That's where we store the oil. It goes to the oil pump. The oil pump goes uh, to, sends it to a oil cooler and a filter, right? That filters it out for any uh, contaminants or dirt from the engine or, or uh, you know, uh, debris in the engine. That runs through a valve, which sends it to your oil temperature and oil pressure gauge, which is what you see in the aircraft, and that it just loops around the system. It's like a nice loop, and it, it'll send it to the engine, accessories, bearings, right? It keeps it nice and lubricated. It keeps the system nice and cool. It keeps it clean because it all flows through again and goes to the, the oil filter, right? So it's constantly cleaning the system. And it's sealing it, right? So it's it's creating seals around. Um, just know if you have a brand new engine, like we uh, sometimes have in our fleet when the engines time out, uh, just make sure that uh, you check with the front desk um, because brand new engines need mineral oil, which is a different type than the normal oil. At Princeton, we use 20W50. And a lot of people, when you, when you hear the word uh, 20W50, you're like, you know, that's just the oil we use. Nobody really thinks about the numbers. What do those numbers mean, All right? I had to go through this. I had to fill my car with oil just a couple of days ago and I had to uh, be t paying attention to it, this because, you know, it talks about, it, uh, oil is a very viscous fluid, right? Um, in the morning, let's say you come and fly Princeton Airport um, in the morning, you check the oil, you'll see the oil is very black. But then let's say you go and fly the aircraft and all of a sudden the oil is very, 
like slick and very liquidy because oil gets, I think the term is less viscous with heat and more viscous in colder temperatures. So the grades, you'll see that's how it's written on the bottle, right? So the 20 talks about the viscosity at lower temperatures. The W indicates that it's a good grade for uh, uh, winter operations, right? So it can, with, with, it can withstand colder temperatures. And then the last number talks about the viscosity at higher temperatures, um, the, you know, the, how liquidy it is at higher temperatures. So I think, you know, I think that's really cool to think about because you know, different types of oils have different viscosity levels. So that's why you want to be very, very mindful. Make sure you put the right oil inside the fuel tank. I mean, inside the, <laughs> inside the oil uh, reservoir, um, the oil drain, because what can happen is if you put a grade that's doesn't get or, or is too thick or is too viscous at certain temperatures, you can cause a lot of pressure builds up in, in the systems um, versus if you have something that's not as um, viscous, it can lead to low pressure in the system, which will lead to, which is the last slide on our systems here presentation. Common issues and failures when you're dealing with uh, reading oil uh, in the system. High oil temperatures. It's, uh, oh, I guess this is an error. I apologize, apologies, guys. I guess I, I didn't replace this part here. Um, but just talking off the beat, I'll uh, fix this error in the slides here when it's distributed to you guys. Apologies again. Uh, but high oil uh, temperature. Let's say we have a high oil temperature in the system or flying along. Uh, typically, I've only heard about this happening in like super hot states. Uh, let's say you're flying along and, and you're in Arizona and you have high oil temperature readings. The, just the aircraft is way too hot. Sometimes the aircraft is just generally way too hot. What you want to do is reduce engine power, lower the nose and increase cooling, right? Another issue, let's say you have high oil temperature. Um, that can be caused by, let's say, uh, the oil is not the right grade of viscosity. Uh, it's not able to hold the, uh, the temperature as well as the right viscosity would, right? Because the whole reason why oil is such a thick substance is because it, it can capture and hold uh, uh, heat effectively. Um, and if you don't have the right viscosity, it won't be able to hold that heat as effectively, which will lead to high uh, oil temperatures. High oil pressure, a blockage in the system that may be preventing the oil to circulate. Um, uh, so in that scenario, uh, land as soon as practical or, or land as soon as possible, right? So that's that's more of an emergency, right? Because without oil, you know, you don't want to be in an aircraft because you can deal with a catastrophic failure. Um, low oil pressure, um, if you don't, if you have a leak in the system or if there's uh, um, uh, too much, uh, yeah, if you have a leak in the system or if you don't have the correct grade of viscosity, again, it will lead to low oil pressure systems land as soon as possible. Um, if you are, uh, if you have a dead brake and pedals, right? So if you do your brake test, um, whether that's before landing, or maybe even on the ground that you do the brake test and you realize that the brakes are um, not holding any pressure. Uh, you want to make sure that let's pull, if you're on the ground, you pull the mixture, stop the engine, right? And see if it rolls, maybe it comes to a complete stop. If you're in the air, right? Maybe, you know, that you have a hyd hydraulic fluid leak, find a long runway, right? Um, uh, I'm not saying go to McGuire Air Force Base, but go to an airline uh, air, airport with uh, resources, maybe Trenton with a long runway that you can coast for a little bit longer, right? And then uh, it'll be easier to come to a complete stop or uh, find a long, uh, find a grass runway. Um, 
somewhere in the vicinity, right? Look at your section, look for the uh, grass runways that you can do because the grass can help slow down the plane naturally. All right, guys, thank you. Thank you for your patience here. Uh, look, knowledge leads to understanding. Understanding your aircraft leads to better control. Um, you know, that's the benefit of it. And we want to be knowledgeable about these things. And we want to make sure that we understand everything that goes into our aircraft. Any questions? I know uh, it, the, the time went over. Guys, if you need to go, I won't be offended. I really appreciate you guys for uh, sitting in and uh, listening to my presentation. I hope I helped, uh, you know, teach you guys something new. Um, hey, Mike, uh, I have a question if, you, if you're... If you're asking for questions, sure. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, this is Sri Ram. Yeah, so yes, uh, yeah. I, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I had a quick question about this thing, right? So you, yes, it's a, a brilliant uh, thing that we we're, we're talking about all these things, um, the circuit breakers and all that stuff, right? We mm -hmm. we only check these things during startup phase, and after that, we have never checked it, right? Like like for example, the temperature gauges, the pressure gauges, and all that stuff, we do only during the run up phase. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but excuse my ignorance, if I'm wrong, uh, just explain to me based on your experience. Uh, do we have to even do that during flight to see uh, how these things uh, are reacting? Or will there be any indications to us uh, saying, hey, something has gone wrong or uh, things like that? Uh, how, how do we yes. are, should we? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's a really great question. Um, yes, we check these things during flight. Now, um, your training. Um, and a lot of us in this uh, uh, chat right now are training. So a lot of times we're focused on flying the aircraft. So we're not really noticing these things. But as a CFI, as an instructor, part of my due diligence in the aircraft is to be scanning these things. And the more experience you get, the, the easier it is for you to divide your attention, right? Flying the aircraft. But I'm also behind the scenes, I'm continually scanning the aircraft instruments. I'm continually scanning the circuit breakers. Now, oh, okay. as far as annunciations go, right? You have the annunciator panel, which will um, in the Cessna 172R and S model, <laughs> right in your line of sight, that's how they designed it, right in your line of sight, the annunciator panel's right there. So if you do have uh, any uh, failure that's resultant of a uh, critical system. You'll normally see a light there indicating that there it's, it's limited, but it'll give you hints as to where to look. Um, but yeah, as, as you gain more experience, you'll be able to divide your attention and scan all of your instruments. And then once you get your private pilot's license, you'll be at that level where you're continually standing all your oil, your gauges, your circuit breakers um, as part of your regular scan. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Yes, sir. I was just Sorry. See you soon. I'm looking forward to flying with you, sir. Yes, sir. I'll be there. Nice. All right. Any additional questions? Actually, I do have a question. This is Bayard. Um, <clears throat> I have the, the, the very famous question about the magnetos and left and right. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed some of your diagrams have left and right actually reversed. Oh, let's see. Let's go back up. So, um, as far as the which one, uh, which one am, uh, am I testing in which setting? Gotcha. So, uh, let's go back up there to the diagram. Yes, on, on that one, you see it. Um, you yeah. See so the there, the there, is, there, there is left and right on the left uh, on um, left left bottom picture. Yep. Right and left are actually reversed. Ah, uh, yes. I, I, it's funny. It's funny. It's, um, I saw this online. Somebody asked this question on Reddit, and I think it had to do with, um, so, so the thing is, if I'm, uh, if, if I'm putting this, the switch onto left, meaning into the middle, yeah. Yes. Yep. I'm actually grounding the right one, right? So it, it it's the left one is mm, that's a good question. I'm gonna admit I'm not sure as far as that I'm sorry, I just got I, I, I really got got 
I, I know the, mm -hmm. the setting is basically reverse. Yeah, you're, you're grounding the other one. But then I got confused, which one am I testing and what do I expect to see with my decrease of 50 or, 50 or 100 RPM? Gotcha. So well, personally, if I see anything, if I see, if I do these tests, I do it, uh, do it in one setting, I do it in the other setting and it doesn't, uh, one fails to decrease, I wouldn't fly. Oh, okay. See, see. That's the but bottom that, line. <laughs> don't that's fly the bottom line. Point. But I don't know. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell which which magneto is actually the one that's really failing. Gotcha. So if uh, if you turn it the key to the right magneto, and let's say you don't see a drop, yeah. um, that would be an issue with the right, right? And if you turn it the key to the left, that would be an issue with the left. Right. So it's based off of the indicators that you see. Right. So they make it very simple that way. Um, that is that is uh, something uh, that is good to clear up as well. Um, let's say that you check the magnetos and it you do not see an RPM drop. Mm -hmm. That is something called the uh, P leads. That's a possibility of the P leads being broken. And what the P leads are, um, they're effectively like a grounding wire. Or grounding cable for yeah. the magnetos themselves, um, and that the the P lead a, a ground being connected with the P lead is what prevents the aircraft from starting when you are on the ground just checking you know the lights and components. Like for example, when you approach the aircraft and you turn on the master switch, um, the reason why the aircraft probably you know won't it won't be susceptible to the prop just spinning erratically is because the magnetos are grounded, right? So they will shut off until you activate them. Mm -hmm. um, if you are at the run-up area and you turn the magnetos to the left or the right mag and you do not see a drop, a possibility could be that the P lead is broken, uh, meaning that you want to be very careful around the propeller when the master's on, I mean, regardless, you want to be careful around the propeller yeah. when the master's on, but you just want to be careful around the propeller when the master's on, on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I'm aware, that issue is, does not necessarily affect in flight operations, but it is something to definitely, it, it needs to be taken a look at, right? So it needs to be, you know, reported so that the P leads can be fixed primarily for a safety concern. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and yes, yeah. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that, that clarified it for everyone there. Um, but yes, uh, if, you know, if that's ever the case, just uh, take the aircraft back, squawk it, make sure that someone is able to inspect it and uh, reconnect or repair the P leads. Okay, thank you very much. No, of course, of course. Pleasure to clarify that. Um, uh, any other questions? Michael, I put a link in the chat. There's a good AOPA article on mag checks. Nice. Go, it's pretty good. I, I read it before I did my check right to understand it. It, it is confusing. Oh, yeah, right there, right? So they do. Um, I'm looking at the article here. Yeah, it does mention the P lead there, but I'm sure they, AOPA, they, they have a lot of mechanics on, you know, in there. So I'm sure if you read that article, you're going to get a lot more context from there. So I definitely recommend anything from AOPA is, is definitely great reading material, guys. Thank you very much for that, uh, Andrew. Awesome, hey, thank Super you. Quick. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hello? Hello. Um, yeah. now, now everybody's muted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have a silly question, Mike. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, silly question, random question, but um, I know that uh, with the explaining about the sumping, do you recommend waiting a few minutes before potential particles can get down to the bottom of that tank to sump? Or, I mean, I've gotten so used to just filling the tank, going right under and sumping, but I, I don't know now, after your explanation, I, I understand more about how that works. And again, thank you for that. Should I be waiting a few minutes? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I, I started recently doing that. I mean, a good pilot's always learning. So 
um, I didn't know, I, I know I heard from Greg Hill, the examiner, you know, he had mentioned to me that yes, it does, it does take a few moments for, you know, maybe sediments or anything that was input into the tank from a fuel refill to settle down to the bottom of the tank. So if you do have the time, right, wait maybe a minute or two, a couple minutes, just for that to settle down to the tank so that you can sump the cup to full just to make sure that it is absolutely clear. So yeah, yeah, that 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 is a recommended practice. All right, sounds good, man. Thank you. Yes, sir. Pleasure. All right. I believe there was another question there that was asked. No? All right, guys. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. It was a real pleasure, guy. I really appreciate you guys uh, sticking around for the presentation. And again, I hope I taught you guys something that uh, you didn't know before. I hope I cleared up some subjects. And I hope that because of this, you can become a safer, better, a more skilled aviator. Thanks, man. Have a great night. You as well, Thank sir. you, Michael. If there's any Take other care, topics, it's if there's any other topics that people um, feel like they would benefit from or want to dig deeper in, please let us know. That helps guide kind of our track in terms of what our presentations are about. But thanks everyone for coming and great job, Michael. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Uh, it was great. Uh, and uh, any inputs on. Uh, what happened in the uh, uh, Long Island incident? What went wrong or something like that? Any thoughts, any first opinions before? Ooh, uh, Long Island incident. Well, I, I can't uh, talk on um, anything that's still uh, being investigated. So I'm not too familiar with the surrounding circumstances. Nothing is, you know, I, I haven't heard anything that has come out regarding that incident. So we'll wait for the report, right? We'll wait for yep. the professionals, the NTSB to do their job. They're going to investigate that. And then from there, we'll be able to read the port report and uh, find out more information. But until then, uh, we'll wait for that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sounds good, sir. Nice. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Goodbye. Have a good night. Thank you. Awesome presentation. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Good night and a very well done presentation, Michael. I really liked it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. That was a really good one. Thank you.